Good morning. For the very first panel of the conference, high-powered authors. It went over so well last year, we wanted to do it again. And so we have, uh, we'll ask uh, our panelists to introduce themselves. If you would go first, Rebecca. Oh, geez, I'm sorry, I'll cut you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Mesta. Um, I've been an author since, I don't know. I thought I was going to be an author when I was a teenager, and I didn't get around to it till much later, so I didn't actually start getting published till the 1990s, early 90s. Um, I've written um, in a lot of different universes, uh, Star Trek, um, Star Wars, uh, Starcraft, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and also written um, books with my husband, Kevin J. Anderson, and um, mostly traditionally published. I'm Christine Catherine Rush. Some of you know me from my blog, which is at chriswrites.com. Um, I blog on the publishing industry a lot because I have been in the publishing industry forever. Um, I did start as a teenager. Um, so when I tell you I have 40 years of experience, I'm not as old as I sound. Um, I'm almost as old as I sound. Um, I was in traditional publishing for a long time in almost every job except agent. Um, I've owned publishing companies. I still own publishing companies. I also have other companies as well, and I have been a writer since I was a published writer since I was 16 years old. Um, I am also hybrid in the traditional sense, I'm like, and the um, Michael's sense that he mentioned this morning. Um, I am wide and exclusive. I am also uh, traditionally published and um, indie, mostly indie with my books for legal and contract reasons, which we may get into at some point later in the, in the conference. But um, so, you know, if you have a question about the history of publishing, I know it. If you have an, uh, a question about current publishing, I probably know what I think about that because it's changing all the time. So welcome to this. It's good to see so many faces. Hi, my name is Alex Liddell. I started out with Penguin and traditional publishing, uh, then I switched to indie publishing with the reverse harem genre specifically is what I'm writing the most. Uh, and so come if you want to talk to me about the difference between indie and traditional, I'm your person. Uh, if you like to talk business, uh, a power five books launched in the top 25 on Amazon, so you can guess whether I'm staying with indie or going back to traditional. I'll leave. <laughs> I'll leave that guess to you, but I think both avenues are amazing, and I'm happy to talk about any or all. I'm uh, Mallory Cooper. I used to um, be Michael Cooper, so if you read my book, Help My Facebook Ads Suck, you might not recognize me. <laughs> I look a little bit different now. Um, I, write, I write science fiction. I've created a universe called Aeon 14, and my goal for that is actually to make it ultimately be the largest... Um, internally consistent science fiction universe ever made. My goal is to have five, about five to 600 books in that universe, and that's sort of what I'm marching toward. So me and my, my co-authors, um, we've been at this for two years now, uh, two and a half, I guess, and this year we'll reach 100 books in the universe, so we're chugging along. So, so the question, if you wanna talk about that, about how to build a big universe, how to manage being insane most of the time, um, or how to do Facebook marketing and a bunch of other fun marketing stuff, I'm always around. Hello, I'm Lindsay Baroker. I've been in, an indie author from the beginning, almost since the beginning of the Kindle revolution. End of 2010, I published my first novel. I think I'm around 70 or 80 right now between my name and my pen name. And gosh, I don't even know what else to talk about up here. I, uh, I did the science fiction and fantasy marketing podcast for four years. We're now, yay, we're now, <laughs> you were on my show. <laughs> We're now doing the Six Figure Author Podcast, so anybody who's not sci-fi fantasy can come on. And it's, it's really been great interviewing people and seeing so many different roads to success. So, I, you know, I'm kind of the solo author. I don't want to publish anybody else. I have never wanted to be published by anybody else. And I'm a bit of a genre hopper, so you can do it that way. You can do it the right-to-market way. There's a ton of paths to success. It sounds like you all still have your foot on the gas. So what is your current target or goal of success? Lindsay? <laughs> While you're hot. 
Um, at this point, I'm just trying to keep everything going. I'm uh, buying real estate on the side so that if everything crashes tomorrow, I'll be okay. But um, just I'm, I'm trying to learn just like you guys are. Uh, everything changes so quickly, especially in the indie sphere here, that um, I, it's really great to hear from everybody, all the different methods out there that are working right now and what's going to be working next year. So just trying to keep things going and uh, keep writing new books that my fans enjoy. I guess it's it's kind of what I mentioned already. I have this I have this sort of one goal where I want to create this this massive universe, um, and I want to do it in a way where I'm telling effectively going to tell one story across all of these books. So I'm trying to do something that I don't think has ever been done before, telling just like a, a single story across hundreds and hundreds of books that you can come into from multiple points. And basically, I want people to experience what I'm what we're writing just like you experience history. You know, you can come into it from any point. You can start reading about the Babylonians, the Romans. You can read about the Incans. You can start with the American Civil War. You can start with anywhere and sort of experience this massive history. So I'm trying to do that with, with a giant science fiction universe. And it'll probably kill me, but it's going to be like the best thing ever. So, <laughs> well, I have the last book in my flagship series coming out in January. And after that, it's a new year. So I'm, I'm going to be revamping up with a, a new series, which is... Uh, scary after being with these characters for so long. So that's one of my goals for the next few days is I'm planning out exactly the direction I want to go for 2020 with a new series, with the flagship series coming to a close. Cool. Um, I'm a Gemini, so I have two parts to my brain. And one part of my brain is very business oriented. That's why I write the business column and I explore what's going on and, and try to find out the new stuff and always look at what's current and see what's going to help my, my businesses and my writing. Um, and then I have the other side of my brain, which is the writing side of my brain, which does not let any of that business stuff in ever um, and doesn't allow to talk about that or anything else. Um, and so, you know, that one, I kind of call it either the oh shiny or the hummingbird brain because it's going, oh, cool, oh, cool. Oh, cool, I want to do that. Um, and so I don't tell you what I'm working on because it may change from hour to hour. But uh, what I'm actually, what I just published is the latest book in my diving series, which is actually a brick because we've got the paper books now and it's 800 pages. Um, and <laughs> it was just ridiculous. Uh, we did a Kickstarter on it and that, that was really successful and everything else. Um, and so I don't know what's going to be published in 2020 because I never, ever set up my publication schedule because of that hummingbird brain side of things, um, until the book is done. So um, the only thing I know for sure right now is that I will have a nonfiction book out uh, about licensing for authors, which is called Rethinking the Writing Business. So that's the only thing I know that's coming out in 2020 at the moment. I've got a lot of plans. We'll see if it happens. Um, I wish that uh, writing was the only thing you had to do to keep your foot on the pedal and um, go full speed ahead, but that's not the way it works anymore. That was the olden days, and we're not in the olden days. And like Chris, um, Kevin and I are publishers. We've got about 100 authors now. And so uh, one of the ways we keep our foot on the pedal is to keep diversifying income streams and to try to stay on top of what's going on in the business, just like uh, Craig and Michael have to, and everybody here at 20 bucks, um, so that we can stay on top of it for ourselves and for our authors and pass it along to authors as we do. When you started your journey, what was the one thing that clicked that, took, that uh, helped you take off as an author? Um, well, as I said, I thought I was going to be an author since I was a teenager. And I was what I actually refer to as a dinker. I started books, and then I got distracted by the hummingbird brain, as Chris says. And I would get a brilliant idea for a story, and I'd flit off to something else. So I had a hard drive littered with pieces of books and stories. And um, finally, I started meeting professional authors, and there was this snot-nosed kid about five years younger than me who was actually published that I met named Kevin J. Anderson, <laughs> who started introducing me to actual published authors, and one of them said, you, you're writing, but you don't have anything done? That's just chicken shit. Go home, pick a story, and finish it. <laughs> and that was kind of what kicked me off, was... I started finishing things. 
What kicked me off? Um, I came from a family of readers, and I'm 20 years younger than my siblings, so my earliest memories are of me begging people to pay attention to me while they were reading. Didn't work. So I think I became a writer to attract attention. But aside from that, what kicked me off, it's a hard question to answer after 40 years in the career, because what happens is, unfortunately, um, it doesn't matter if you're traditional or indie, because it's happening in indie now, too. Uh, careers don't go like this. They go like this. And so there are, you kick off, and then you go really well for a while, and you hit whatever the current thing is, and you go really well, and then you crash. And then after you've crashed, you have to pick yourself up again and keep going. And that was, I think, the thing that we were, uh, when I met Kevin when he was even a snottier-nosed kid, because we were in college together. Um, and, you know, he was 19. He was, he's younger than me, too. Um, and, you know, he was, he was the guy who kind of inspired me to get other stuff done, because he told me what genre I was writing in. I had no clue. Um, and um, at dinner last night, Kev said, you know, the thing is, we're one of the few survivors. Um, we're the very few people we know that were there when we started are still here. And I can say that about the indie movement, too. Very few people who were there in 2009. Lindsay's one of the, the success stories. Um, she, you know, there's not here anymore. They came and they crashed and they didn't pick themselves up. And that's the real key to survival in this industry is it doesn't matter how long you're laying on the floor. Figure out what you did. Figure out what happened. Sometimes it's the world. Pick yourself up and then move it forward again. That's why having conferences like this is so great, because you learn what the new stuff is, and you go, ooh, shiny, that, and go that way. I'm gonna focus on the step between that really changed my uh, business of writing, and that was hands down market research. Um, I went into the romance, reverse harem romance, the romance subgenre, and, uh, learning to respect my readers' likes, respect the tropes, uh, and figuring out what they are, and then writing with very respectfully to those preferences. Uh, and that made a huge difference. So for me, it was, it was um, two things. It was, I, tried, I filled a niche, I think, that um, hadn't been filled before. I love like rollicking space adventure, but I also love the science to be correct. And most rollicking space adventure, like Star Wars and whatnot, has like zero science. So I started writing hard science fiction space opera, which has like all this fun and adventure and crazy stuff going on, but the science behind it is all really accurate in it, and it, it feeds a lot into the story. And um, nobody read that. Um, <laughs> Um, because I didn't know how to put it in front of the people that were going to read it. And so I published my first book in 2012, and I sold maybe 300 copies until 2016. And I discovered this thing called advertising. And um, I was able to find the people that wanted to read my books. And I took a book that had languished for four years and kept it in the, about the top 7,000 on Amazon for six months um, through advertising. And that is actually that one event was what, what built my career. So that was sort of my, my flashpoint. And that's sort of why a lot of times I talk about advertising and whatnot, because it's, I'm, I'm here today because... I started, under, I understood how to do that and understood how to get my strange niche series of books in front of the right people. All right, uh, two points for me early on. The first one was just seeing other people succeeding and having a lot of success. So I appreciate everybody in the beginning that blogged about like, here's my numbers on Amazon, here's what I'm making. And I thought, you know, if they can do it, I can do it too. Um, but I was never really super confident. I, I made a lot of mistakes early on. We didn't have cover designers and the whole industry that's kind of been built up. So you had to go out and <laughs> really dig around on DeviantArt or whatever to try to find somebody to do your covers. So I, I feel like I, you know, I didn't hit the floor running. I really made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. And what really made me believe I could do this as a career and for a living was when I got to the point where I, I put up my Facebook author page. You know, I think I had like three books out. And people found me right away. They're there. We were waiting for your Facebook author page. You know, we wanted to con contact you. Uh, and this was only when I had, you know, maybe a few hundred sales of each of the first books in my series. And, you know, just the fan response and, you know, realizing that if I had, a, you know, the kind of the 1,000 true fans paradigm, if you've got this many people that really love the books you're putting out and the way you tell the story, you can have a career. No matter what the market's doing, you're always going to have X number of people that go out and buy your book. And it's super powerful, and that's what led me to realize, okay, I think I can make this work. A hypothetical. An author has 10 books out, 10 books, and they're not making any money. How would you, take, how would you advise them to look at their business? Hold 
Oh, hold on, they have 10 bucks out. Now tell me, are, um, how did you, how did you, let's take a look at your covers in your 10 books and the top covers of the same similar books that are best selling. Are your covers like the best selling books in those genres or not? They are in all 10 of them. <laughs> um, all right. And tell me about how your last, what did you do for the launch of your last book? I, I, w I wrote it. That's a great start. <laughs> and, and <laughs> you asked it. Um, are these books all in a series or are they all in different genres? No, they're 10 different genres. <laughs> okay, there's your problem. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I would consider for, and I'll pass it off to our advertising guru, but one thing I would consider is uh, if you are doing true market research, it's hard to do it for 10 genres at the same time and stay up on top of current trends. Two is uh, in terms of advertising, if your books have read through from one to another, you can afford to spend more money advertising book one, and that will extend to the rest of your books, where since you have the books in 10 different genres, it is more difficult to move the reader from one book to another. So I would encourage you to work on uh, more books in a series for sell-through, focus how, market research on... Uh, how do I know if my books are any good? Who's, who does the good books? <laughs> okay, I'm an editor. There we go. And um, I do want to know whether or not these books have been edited by a professional or not, or if you just threw them up onto the wall and sent no, no, them out been into edited. the I world. I paid $1,000 each to get each one edited. Okay. Here's what I would tell you, 10 books and 10 genres. If you'll notice on my badge, it says what genre? It says all, because I'm that person, okay? And the thing is that when you write in more than one genre, you want people to follow your voice, which is a hard, hard path to follow. I mean, you have Douglas Adams, you have people like that who are voice writers and people will buy anything that they have written because they, they like their voice. But otherwise, you can't expect reader to go from book to book to book to book. So. You follow, you find which one of your 10 genres speaks to you the most, write a few more books in that genre, and then move. You don't, you don't just do it, you know, 10 random. You do five here, five there, five here, five there. And you can be in the multiple genres, but realize it's gonna be a lot tougher for you than it is for all the, you know, anybody who's gonna be doing 10 books in the same series. I have a fully unscientific, but it seems to work model that might work for you. So here's my theory, it's 30, 30, 30, 10, as to uh, the parts that are going to determine your book's success. But like a college test, you can get up to 30 points in each category, you can't get any more. All right, so you get up to 30 points for, how, for the quality of your books, how good they are, how well they're edited. You get up to 30 points how well you're doing marketing on your books. You know, how good you're using all the ads with your expert over here. You can get up to 30 points for how to market your books are to begin with, which is your initial research. And then 10 points is pixie dust. So, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like I said, highly scientific. Theory. So I would look at each of those categories and realize you can't get more than 30 points. So changing that, making sure that typo on page 472 is not the reason for your change in your career. Um, I, would, I would say the other thing too is to read the reviews. I mean, it's hard to say in a scenario like that, an author might not have a lot of reviews, but the reviews are gonna tell you why people don't like the books if they don't like them, and it can hurt and then you have to go and cry for a little while in a fetal position in the bathtub, you know, like doing the Ace Ventura thing, you know, where he's washing himself and crying. But you, you get over that, and then you, you go read it again, and, and you actually objectively look at what you might have done wrong. And that's, that's a, a good place to go. It's the worst place to go, but it's the place you have to go. 
Uh, everybody made good points. I would say to you that if you had asked, like, how do I know if there are any good, even though I'm diehard self-publisher, indie author, before I got into this, I submitted short stories to magazines because that was the way you had to do it. And I, I don't think that's a bad idea, even if you're planning to have an indie career, because if you can start selling some of your work to uh, jaded editors out there, which we might have some editors around here, you know, it, it's kind of a litmus test. You at least know the writing itself is not the problem if you're struggling to find an audience. That's it. Thank you very much for that. We have a microphone up here. If you'd like to ask questions, you have to get in line, and uh, and uh, then we'll pick you and ask. In the interim, well, while we're waiting for people to come up, I want to add one thing. Um, the real key to getting fans, to getting people to love your work, is storytelling. Mm. Um, your storytelling has to be really good, and you can actually figure that out by finding five readers who are not writers. And having them read the book, and, and yeah, and and make sure that they, you know, and don't ask them, is it good, is it bad, do you like this scene on page 34? Just have them tell you their reaction. Where would they find it if they went to a bookstore? Um, you know, what what did they like best about it? Let them talk to you, and you'll figure out if you, you know. If they said it took me six weeks to read it, you got a storytelling problem. Okay, you want them to read it all, take one night, two days, whatever their time. And then you can figure out storytelling, learn more craft. That's a, that's a great point, and that's uh, why Mark Dawson called his company Unput Downable, because yeah. that's the key to success. Liz. Yes, in every career you hit plateaus, and... A little closer to the mic, please. In every career you hit plateaus, and you hit many of them. How did you dig deep and come back to the table and figure out how to level up. I did start the plateau. Um, well, you have to really want it, guys. You, I mean, if you are being a writer and you don't really want it, there's other things that are easier to do. There are a lot of things. And now, because the ending revolution is going so well, there are related things. You can be a cover designer. You can be an editor. You can do all this other stuff that still keeps you in this world, but it doesn't keep you writing. So the first thing is you have to really love it. And then go back to what you love about it. So if you really like telling stories with space opera sort of themes, but hard science, which sounds really good, um, then you know go back and write that and find your enthusiasm again. That's what's gonna keep you going, is your enthusiasm. Um, but make it fun, play. If you have to protect that space, I don't read reviews because my, that side of my hummingbird brain will never get off the bathroom floor. So I don't read them. I don't care, I don't care. I'm not writing, I'm sorry, my readers out there. I'm not writing for you, I'm writing for me. So if you don't like what's happening out there, that's okay, I do. Um, but if I don't like it, it's gonna, you know, I'm gonna keep re reworking it until I do. Somebody else? I think if you get to the point where, does this one work? <laughs> well, you're, you're stuck, I mean, uh, you know you have to be realistic too. It's like, oh, I'm stuck at seven million dollars a year, and just how do I get to the next level? I don't know. <laughs> But if you're, you feel like you could be doing better and you're struggling, I think part of it is, you know, are you, I'm a little bit stubborn myself. I write the stories I like to write and then I figure out how to market them instead of writing to market necessarily. But if you've been doing that and it's not working for you as well as you think it would, maybe it's time to explore, like, let me see what's a little more commercial that I might be able to do the next series that you still enjoy writing. But, it, you know, you have to decide, do you want the money or do you just want to write what makes you happy? And, and sometimes there is a little clash in between those two. And uh, some people can make it work and, and some people have to just decide, I'm going to go for the more commercial route because it's more successful. And I think also if you just find somebody that's sort of higher on the pole or where you want to be and, you know, stalk them, the Internet makes <laughs> this really easy. You know, see what they're doing that maybe you're not doing yet and that you could implement. How do I follow that? I mean, stalk <laughs> them, right? That's what you should be doing. Um, I, I actually had an issue with that this summer. I hit a wall, um, and part of that was due to transitioning. I, I had no idea how much headspace that was going to cons consume. Um, the other part is that um, I've learned this important lesson that testosterone just makes you think you're amazing, and when you don't have testosterone, you're like, dear God, I'm terrible all the time. <laughs> so, uh, it's true, it's true. Yeah, I've, I've learned so many lessons. Um, 
So yeah, I, I was at a point where like last year I was releasing, like last August I wrote 250,000 words and I spent a week in Disney. Um, and this past August I wrote like 30,000 words and I worked like 16 hours a day and that's all I managed to do. And that happens sometimes. And, it, and, and it's gonna be, the answer is different for everybody, but you're gonna have to take a step back and refocus and figure out what's important to you. And also know that it happens to everybody. Everybody hits walls, everybody has to figure out, get past them. But it's like Catherine said, you have to really want it. And I've got that goal I mentioned before. I wanna have this massive universe with all these books and this big story, and I'm not done yet. So I'm gonna keep going until I'm done. Uh, within within uh, publishing as a whole, what are the biggest changes y'all are anticipating for 2020, and what changes are you most excited about looking forward? I'm going to spend more money on Amazon ads next year. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> I think, yeah, the, just the change that there's so much more out there. There's so much more competition. We just have to really be good, really up our game. And um, I'm waiting for the day when I can get an AI assistant of myself so I don't have to hire anybody else. But I also don't have to do all the things myself. That's got to be coming. Oh, I hope that's coming. Except I want my assistant to be a lot more organized than I am. You're you might have to worry about your AI slave assistant rebelling, so I would, I would keep that in mind. You know? They may not want that. Yeah. Um, I think actually still, I, I feel like the, the thing that we really also keep doing is keeping on writing is the big thing. Um, the other thing you have to keep do, you have to do is you have to figure out like what cool hip technology the kids are using because when they abandon it, all of the older readers will start using it. Um, I'm not too sure which order it goes in to be honest. It could be the older readers people show up and then the kids abandon it. But like you know, you actually should be like, what is Snapchat? What is TikTok? Um, can I actually advertise on those platforms? The answer is yes, you can actually advertise on those platforms. Um, what is the, the number one place where, where readers are on the planet is Facebook, 3.2 billion people. What's the number, number two? It's Reddit, 1.2 billion humans are on Reddit all the time. Have you ever been to Reddit? Do you know how to advertise on Reddit? And, and it, with, just like we all learned with Facebook and became terrible addicts, you have to go and sort of experience that thing and like understand how people who use it as users use it before you start advertising in it. So with all these other platforms, you can't do them all, but you might actually say like, I'm gonna try TikTok, I'm gonna make stupid videos, it'll be hilarious, you know, and then get into it and you might actually figure out there's a way to reach new people and advertise and branch out. Okay, um, in the overall, I, I wanna take this out of the publishing realm because Publishing is backwards, and traditional publishing doesn't know what the heck it's doing, and so many indies base what they do on traditional. Um, and so if you take it out and you take it wider, Rebecca mentioned something earlier that was really important. She said they look at different income streams throughout the thing, and that's what I do through my career in the business side, not the writing side. I look for different income streams, and what's got me really exciting right now is I went to the licensing expo, those of you who live here in Las Vegas um, can go for free, and you know, readers don't just come from bookstores and libraries and e-retailers and e-sites and Reddit and Facebook, they come, they play a game, uh, a video game, and if you have an ad for it at the end, they will come that way, or they, they get really enthusiastic, let's say you license your book to a video game, and they get really enthusiastic about the game, but they've never played, or they've never read your book. At some point, they're gonna want more of the game, there's not gonna be enough of the game, so they're gonna go get books. That's a tried and true method, but there's all these other ways that it works. I mean, Mattel comes out with books about their dolls, for heaven's sakes, which means there's a market for it. So we, I think, we as writers and as business people, let's talk business people right now, have got a completely untapped market out there of other ways that are not libraries, bookstores, e-tailers, and that stuff to appeal to readers. And traditional publishing never touched it. Indie isn't even aware of it. And I think it's vast. And I think it's coming in the next five years. Hi. For those of us who have a full-time job and a family and a life and <laughs> everything else to manage, um, on top of trying to be a writer, what is the one most important thing you would recommend we focus on from a marketing standpoint? I guess it's on me. Um, <laughs> it's, it's to pick one platform, um, except for Twitter. Don't pick Twitter because you'll just die. Um, <laughs> pick one platform and choose that to be sort of the place where you like, you, you, you make a brand for yourself there. And if you if you're working a job and whatnot, like um, readers actually like knowing what author who authors really are. 
Um, don't put your whole self out there because that can be emotionally draining, but uh, make it pick, pick one of those platforms and be real on it and be yourself and, and talk about your books and things you're reading and whatnot. And that, cause that's the sort of thing I think a lot of us would do anyway. And that's a great way to sort of build up people who know you and understand you. And then as you bring books out and whatnot, they're already gonna say, hey, it's that guy. And I like what he said about this thing. And, and that can be a, a great way to sort of ease into it. And I'm going to chime in for a second, though this is, doesn't go specifically to marketing. It does go to uh, best uses of time, which is to analyze when and how are you are most productive. So you can get more done in an hour than somebody gets done in four hours, or that you yourself would usually get done in four hours when you have looked at data points about yourself. So for example, my hour between nine and 10 in the morning is much more valuable to me than between six and seven at night. I'm going to get a lot more done. If I have one hour, I need that hour. I can't just switch family activities around, you know, and go out with the kids in the morning and then I'll just write in the evening. I know the productivity isn't gonna be there. Um, does few, try several things and keep track of what makes it what gives you the most productivity for that time. Another example, a friend of mine turned me on to For the Words, where you can, you battle monsters against time. Well, I discovered that if I'm sitting down with a little circle that tells me how many words I have and how much time I have left, writing 500 words is easy. When I'm sitting with a, just a Word document, writing 500 words takes two to three times as long. Um, so I have made that, I have tested it, I know I don't, if I don't have access to that program for initial drafting, I know that is not going to be a good use of my time to just open a Word document. I'll get more done later when I do have access to that program, so I need to use that time for something else. Um, I will do my marketing stuff in the evening because I know it's not my productive writing time. So using that time and figuring out data points for yourself. I would say also too, if you're really limited with time, to just focus on making sure that your newsletter and mailing lists are set up really well. You know, that when people do come and find you, that you're saying like, here's all, here's the books, or maybe you've got a drip campaign that, you know, I don't actually do this myself, I should. But you know, that's got like the next four or five emails they're gonna get, so that when you do win a fan, that they're gonna stick around, because word of mouth, I can't, you know, I get tagged all the time on Facebook by people who are talking about my books in their Facebook groups. There's really nothing more powerful than that. And it doesn't take me any time. They're talking about them. But to get to that point, you know, really nurturing your fan base. And I'm still a fan, even here in 2019, of a book one free in a series, if you've got a series of five or more books. And that it's very easy to just uh, take five minutes to it and apply for an e-reader news today or, you know, all the different book bub if you can get it. They're not as effective, most people find, as they were maybe five years ago, but it's still, an, you know, it's a way to spend $20, get some downloads, maybe you get one true fan out of that. Uh, and just realize that it's being consistent over time with advertising your stuff. It's not like, I gotta have 40 hours a week for the next two months or I'm never gonna make it as an author. So we're typically told to, um, you know, look at our subgenre and look at the indies who are successful rather than looking at trad pub. And I'm finding some success with domestic thrillers, but it's sort of an emerging subgenre as far as I understand. There really aren't indies that have been there a long time. So do you have any recommendations about, you know, getting good footing in, in that space given that situation? I think that you can look at trad publishing if it's a newer author. You don't want to look at someone that's like Stephen King, whatever, he can put out a napkin and it's going to sell. You know, <laughs> if there's a debut author and the blurb, you know, if it's really catching on, I, I would go ahead and use that in as, as an example. I just, I feel like we say like, well, look, George R. R. Martin blurb is not that great. And he's, you know, you know, you got to look at somebody that's new also and having success. Are you, by domestic thrillers, do you mean Gone Girl and that sort of thing? Yeah, they're different. They're a little more emotional, a little more um, relationship, character focused than the gritty crime. There is crime, but it's it's treated a little bit differently. Well, I do know we have a suspense and thriller panel coming up um, mm -hmm. later, and it may be something to ask that whole panel. I'm, I'm going to be on that too. But um, you know, one of the things that you can do is um, also look at something called I hate this term, women's fiction. 
mm -hmm. because that is domestic thriller and has been domestic thriller for a long time. Mm -hmm. But right now, you're right, in the indie space, Nobody knows how to market it. And I write a lot of genres like that, that are, you know, you don't know how to market it. So you get to be the test case. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. Awesome. Uh, I would still go find the closest comps you can find. Yeah. Uh, do tracking how the best comps that do exist, mm -hmm. how are they, say, if they're in KU, how are they ranking? So you have a comparison point. How do you know if something launches well or is doing well? Well, that depends for what kind of book you're writing and what category. So what is okay, what is subpar, and what is above average, you need to be able to answer those milestones with the best comps you can find so you can actually judge where, how successful you are. Otherwise, you might be launching successfully in comparison to comps and think you're failing or launching what you think is great and you shouldn't be doing anymore, but when you look at comps, you're like, yeah, but I should have been doing a, a whole different story. So the best comps you can to establish baselines of knowing how success, what success looks like. Okay. Thank you. Hey, yeah, I was wondering how you developed your workflows uh, for word production and uh, what that is like and how that may have changed as you evolved as writers? Um, a couple of things that affected word flow was building up um, a group of people who support my writing and who can block out time for me and uh, help me get my work done. And sometimes that involves horse trading. Like, I'll take care of this for you later, so you can get work done if you take care of this, and I can have this much of my day clear for, to do my writing. And another thing was dictating. Um, I used to do, uh, like, a 1,000 words an hour, and then when I started dictating, it went up to 2,000. So that made a huge difference. Um, I could just talk a lot faster than... I could write because I'm a klutz. <laughs> I don't want to do 1,000 words an hour. Okay, I don't do that right now. But when I was a full-time writer, now I do so many other things. Cool. It's not that That's fast. That's really cool. Yeah. I, I found for myself that, um, and I, I don't want it, I wish I wasn't this way, but I work really well with deadlines, and I don't work at all without deadlines. Um, and I wish I wish I could. And I tried actually a bunch to fix this and be like, I'm going to give myself these really long deadlines and like build up this big swath of things and ahead of time. And like, no, I'm going to go play Overwatch is what I'm going to go do <laughs> um, when I do that. So so yeah, I actually I just had to admit to myself that. And, and the funny thing is, I would like write these books like in a week before I had to upload them to KU, um, and my editor would be like following behind me and editing as I'm writing and whatnot. I'm thinking this is a disaster. This could be the worst thing I've ever written. And my fans are like, those are the best books you've ever written. And I'm like, oh. Maybe this is what works for me. So I had to realize, like, I, I have to like base. I had to figure out how to judge myself based on my own work and and how my own work was received, and not based on how I thought I should be doing it or anything like that. And that freed me up a lot to to be more productive in that way as well. It's all mind games, you guys. It really is. Um, figuring out where how to get to your particular word flow. It's it's a mind game. Um, and for me, you know, first of all, I had to take everything off my computer except Word to get myself to finish stuff and take everything out of my office and then set a timer across the room. And so I made myself with a hummingbird brain sit there for an hour and not do anything else. Um, and I finally started writing and that's how I actually got going. Um, but um, I'm a lot more of a hard ass than Rebecca. I just figure people have to get out of my way. Um, if I'm gonna get you know, words done, I'm getting my words done and I'm, I'm really rude about it. Um, and so, you know, that, that's how it works for me. Um, I can't dictate. I worked in radio. Um, and so every time I hear myself make a mistake verbally, I have to go correct it. Um, and it's, that's not effective at all. And I really, really wish I could dictate. I know that works for a lot of you. So, no, I, I actually have to do words to the page. Um, and see, that's another mind game. I, I probably could train myself out of that corrective thing, but that would really hurt my voiceover and radio stuff. So I'm not going to do that. You know, so you, you figure out your own personal mind game. 
write them down, you know, try fail. I, I'm still trying to be able to read a book in the morning. Once I start, you know, at breakfast reading somebody else's work, I don't write the rest of the day. I keep thinking I should be able to overcome that. Nope, can't. talk for 40 seconds. We have 40 seconds. <laughs> I was just uh, going to chime in on that. Um, I, th I was kind of a pantser. I was a complete pantser starting out. And for me, you know, not everybody's going to want to change, but I found that when I started doing outlines, I just got a lot more efficient at more the editing process. Like, I, I can write words. I'm motivated. Like, 5,000 words, that's my goal for today. That's no problem. But um, I have personally found that when I started outlining, I got a lot more efficient and that I was not scrapping whole scenes and having to rewrite whole chapters. So that was the thing that made me faster at getting books finished and out there. And one last question, Kate. Sorry. So I, um, I loved Craig's example of a bad way to start out um, writing 10 books in 10 different genres. And I thought I'd give you another example and see if you can help me out. Because I thought I was super smart. Um, I have no technological ability, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to write for an indie publisher. So I wrote for an indie publisher under a pen name. Um, I put eight books out this year, made six figures. They did really, really well. And then I was listening to the, um, the Craig show on the weekend, and, and they were talking about how um, even with big name writers, so, so let's say there's a Patterson with a writer who's actually writing the book, people don't follow the person writing the book. Even if they like the, the voice, they follow Patterson, they don't follow the writer. So I've written some very, very successful books and no one is going to fucking follow me. <laughs> so, um, so my question is, when you've made that kind of a misstep, do you restart under a different name or do you start building your platform from that name, knowing that people already know that name from a different platform, um, under my publisher's platform? Um, what's your advice for that kind of misstep? It's not a misstep. Let me, let me talk to it for a minute because I wrote Star Trek and Star Wars books and Buffy and a whole bunch of the other stuff too, uh, which is very similar to what you're talking about where you know you have the James Patterson and the person who writes the book. It's not a misstep because your, your statistics are wrong. It's about 10% who cross over to the author, that, the person who actually wrote the book. Readers are smart. So you have a 10% base of whatever that is um, and they will follow you. It's just smaller than you expected. So, you know, if you're going to write, if you like the genre you were writing in, keep writing in it. And they'll follow you over there. If you don't like it, then just keep building and, and start as a new writer, realizing you already have a 10% base of people who like your voice. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we'd like to thank our special guests, our high-powered author panel. Thank you. thank you. I I think there's no better way to kick off the whole conference than having successful people talk about their success and what they've done and any barriers they've overcome to be where they are today. Some people fall out and some people are are stick stick with it, and it's rewarding and uh, you see what the reward is. All right, we'll take a short break. We have the Christmas card bucket up here that I'll take these back to uh, North Pole, Alaska and get them mailed from there, stamped with the North Pole stamp. Um, industry professionals up here at 11, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> 